Thanks very much, Juan, for inviting me. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about this paper that I put out in the archive in May. And there was paper published the same day uh, by Neda Engelhart, Dom Rolf, uh, Henry Maxfield, and Ahmed um, that covered a lot of the same ground. They're not completely the same, but there's very significant overlap. Um, so yeah, I think Ahmed had talked about that here at some point. This is, oh, there we go. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about the black hole information paradox. I'm going to be talking about the black hole information paradox in the context of ADS-CFT, OK? Um, but as we know, ADS-CFT solves the information paradox. To quote uh, Lenny in some pop side book he wrote, Argentina won the war. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's sort of unsatisfying on its own, right? Because to really resolve a paradox, you don't need to just decide what the right answer is. You need to work out why the reason you thought the other answer should be true was wrong. Um, so why was Hawking wrong? Why is this bulk calculation that's seemingly very robust, seems like it shouldn't break down, uh, actually gives completely the wrong conclusions? Um, and if there's one thing we can take away from the whole firewall saga in 2012, it's that 15 years after one came up with ADS-CFT as a field, everyone was still pretty confused about how that was meant to all work. Um, however, since then, there's been a lot of progress made in our understanding of ADS-CFT. There's been ideas like ER equals EPR, the idea that, that entanglement is in some way the same thing as classical area. Uh, there's the idea of entanglement wedge reconstruction. There's the idea that maybe the interior of a black hole is in some way only encoded in the boundary in a state-dependent way. And all of those ideas are going to play a role in this talk. Um, but much of the work has relied on this sort of tool of studying the thermofield double state, this two-sided black hole that we, we understand the geometry of and is sort of a toolbox we can play around with. And it's, it's a wonderful toolbox. It's incredibly useful. Um, but fundamentally, an evaporating black hole is never in the thermofield double state, unless you do some really, really weird things to it. Uh, so at some point, if we're going to understand evaporating one-sided black holes, we need to study evaporating one-sided black holes. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I'm going to make the following assumptions. I'm going to assume that the, the general relativity is a valid description of the effective field theory, and that, that it can be used to, to calculate most quantities you might want to calculate, including, in fact, the page curve. I'm going to assume that even after the page time, where the conventional wisdom would say that the, the, the GR description has to have completely broken down in some way if information is to have got out. And I'm going to assume one more thing. Is there a bad signal here or something? I'm really struggling to, OK. Um, which is, I'm going to assume entanglement wedge reconstruction, OK? And what that really means is that I'm going to be assuming that the replica trick is like a, a giving correct answers for entropies and so on. And that also, this is maybe less clear for general entanglement wedge reconstruction, but it'll be important in this story, that when you do the replica trick, you're allowed arbitrary topologies that connect the replicas in arbitrary ways. So that's going to be my starting point. And I claim that just from these assumptions, I can reach the following conclusions. I claim that I can show that no information at all gets out of the black hole in the Hawking radiation before the page time. Although that's sort of a lie, there's non-perturbatively small corrections to the thermal Hawking radiation that will depend on what I throw into the black hole. But up to non-perturbative effects, nothing gets out before the page time. I'm going to show that entanglement entropy of the black hole follows the page curve. going to show that there's actually no AMPS firewall paradox, that it's completely consistent with entanglement wedge reconstruction. It's going to show that if we threw a diary into the black hole at an early time, then we can reconstruct it from the Hawking radiation immediately after the page time. Whereas if we throw it in after the page time, show that you can reconstruct, reconstruct it after waiting for the scrambling time. So these are collectively hayden Preskill decoding criteria. And I'm not really going to talk about this, but there's also various generalizations of hayden Preskill you can derive for sort of large diaries, uh, black hole states that aren't fully known, and so on. And all of them 
give answers that are consistent with uh, like toy models of black hole evaporation. And I show all these things using bulk calculations. Um, although fundamentally, you know, semi-classical GR does not have information coming out. There is going to be some input from sort of more than semi-classical stuff, and that's going to be coming from entanglement wedge reconstruction, which is really coming from the replica trick and, and saying that, that you know, when you have multiple replicas, then, then you can have connected geometries between them. Um, OK. So let's talk about evaporating black holes in ADS. So when I have a black hole in ADS, it will start to Hawking radiate. But normally, unless it's a very, very small black hole, the Hawking radiation is just going to hit the boundary, and it's going to reflect back in. OK? And your black hole is quickly going to reach thermal equilibrium with the Hawking radiation. Nothing terribly much is going to happen. However, we can very easily change this. All we have to do is change these boundary conditions so that rather than being a reflecting wall, they're an absorbing wall, or at least a partially absorbing wall. It means there's at least some probability that when Hawking radiation gets out here, just escapes the system entirely. I'm going to add an extra system that's going to store that Hawking radiation that escapes. I'm going to call that H rad. So from a boundary perspective, what this corresponds to is it means we're just coupling our CFT with some pretty generic coupling to an auxiliary system, H rad. Um, and technically, the fact that it's absorbing boundary conditions, stuff's going out, but no stuff's coming back in, is corresponding to the fact that the dynamics of the CFT should follow a Markovian master equation. But again, this is very generic if I have a big enough auxiliary system. Um, so for concreteness, I'm going to make the following assumption. I'm going to assume that H rad is itself some very, very large holographic system. So the, the, the Hawking radiation is just going to go into this system. And because it's so large, there's going to be no back reaction. It's going to be a load of thermal radiation sitting in that bulk. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I think that should be fine. I mean, you, you have absorbing boundary. Like, yeah, the, the, the forwards evolution of the system classically will be deterministic. Um, to, to, to reverse the dynamics, you need to have, like, include H rad. You need to know about H rad as well, and then you, you can look at the dynamics of stuff coming back in. But classically, I, I, I don't think there's any problem with the boundary conditions. Um, yeah, we can maybe talk about this afterwards. Yeah, that, exactly. That happens basically automatically. Um, yeah, get that for free. OK, so we now have two holographic boundary systems, OK, the CFT and HRAD. Um, and there's an obvious question, which is what part of the bulk gets encoded in each of those two boundary systems? And that's a question that we now have the tools to answer. We didn't, we didn't have the tools to answer that question five years ago, but we do now. And the answer is that each boundary system encodes its entanglement wedge. Um, so I'm going to take a moment to be quite precise in defining how I'm going to say entanglement wedge reconstruction works. It's the standard definition, but I, you know, we're going to be applying it in a slightly new and unfamiliar context. So I think it's helpful to be very precise. So we're going to start by defining a quantum extremal surface, chi. Okay? And that's defined as the following. It's defined as the surface that is an extremum of the generalized entropy, namely area over 4G Newton plus bulk entropy. OK? So what does the bulk entropy of a space-time co-dimension surface, co-dimension 2 surface mean? Well, really, I'm only going to consider surfaces that satisfy what's called the homology constraint. So the union of chi with my boundary region B is itself going to be the boundary of some space-like region C. OK, that is space-time co-dimension 1. It's like a, a chunk of a spatial slice. And when I write S bulk of chi, what I really mean is S bulk of C. OK? So there's a... Oh, I'll, I'll talk about, yeah. So, so the, the, uh, yes. I, I, within that saddle point, which is a, a classical, yeah, within that classical saddle point with quantum fields about it, 
then it's S bulk of C. But it may turn out to not actually be S bulk of C if you did things differently. But yeah, I'll talk about that later. OK. So there's an important subtlety that shows up when you have absorbing boundary conditions that you don't normally have to worry about with reflecting boundary conditions. And that's the following. If I have reflecting boundary conditions, it doesn't really matter where I anchor my surface C on the boundary. OK? It needs to, where chi like, meets B, if chi does meet B, then, then obviously my, my boundary time has to go there, because it has to be space-like to everywhere on chi. Um, but if I, yeah, I have some freedom to choose the time at which I anchor my surface. And I'll have the same degrees of freedom no matter what time I can anchor the surface on. Right? Something may have gone out and hit the boundary between time t1 and time t2, but it will just bounce back in, and so it will still end up going through this surface. Same degree of freedom in both. If I have absorbing boundary conditions, this is no longer true. Right? Something could be in this surface, anchored at time t1, but then it can escape in the intervening time. And by time t2, it's actually in this other system, h rad. OK? So that means that my generalized entropy depends on boundary time. And since the notion of a quantum extremal surface is defined in terms of the gradient of the generalized entropy, it means the notion of a quantum extremal surface, what surface is quantum extremal, depends, is a time-dependent thing when you have absorbing boundary conditions. OK, that's an aside, but it's going to turn out to be important. And then what I'm going to call the quantum RT surface, other people use different terms, is just going to be the quantum extremal surface that has the smallest generalized entropy. OK? And then the entanglement wedge of our boundary region B, just defined to be the domain of dependence of this space-like slice C, uh, defined using the quantum RT surface. OK? So this is all you need to do all the calculations. It is very helpful to assume that there's an equivalent prescription for the quantum RT surface, which is the following. OK? Rather than first looking for extremal surfaces, we first just pick some Cauchy slice, some ADS Cauchy slice, sort of at random. Okay? And we look for the minimal generalized entropy surface, like globally minimal, within that Cauchy slice. Then we search over all Cauchy slices, doing the same thing in each one, and we find the maximum of that minimal generalized entropy. And the surface that defines that max maximum quantity, I claim, will also be the quantum RT surface. So there's ongoing work by me, Netta Engelhardt, Chris Akers, and Misha Utsuchuk, uh, I believe his said, name is said, to actually show that this is equivalent to the usual quantum extremal surface prescription. But as I say, I don't need it for anything in this paper. It just makes things simpler to argue. OK. So there's one quantum extremal surface for the evaporating one-sided black hole that is very, very trivial. OK. It's literally the surface whose set of points is empty. Okay? It just has nothing in it. So this surface is always quantum extremal by definition because there's no way to perturb it. But normally it's not something we ever think about, right? Because we, we normally, you have to, have to consider surfaces that satisfy the homology constraint. And almost always when we're doing RT, we consider boundary regions that have a non-trivial homology. And so this surface is just disallowed. But in this case, then the union, the boundary of the, of the CFT is itself has trivial homology, right? I can find a space-like slice that just goes through all the way to the origin, and the boundary of that space-like slice is just the boundary of the CFT and nothing else. So that means that the empty set does satisfy the homology constraint. So here's a Cauchy slice. Yeah. So what would the entanglement wedge of this quantum extremal surface be? just the bulk domain of dependence of any Cauchy slice anchored on the boundary of the CFT. Now, normally you would say, I'm really abusing the terminology Cauchy slice here, because normally you'd say the domain of dependence of a Cauchy slice is the entire space-time. Okay? But because we have absorbing boundary conditions, that isn't actually true. Because something outside the past light cone can be affected by something that got absorbed here. Right? So it's not actually in the domain of dependence of the degrees of freedom here. So it's actually this blue patch I drew here. It's the right definition of the, the entanglement wedge for that surface. And the same thing is true for HRAD. 
that the empty surface is homologous to it, because this is just some system that's basically like vacuum ADS with some radiation in it. And its entanglement wedge will just be stuff in that extra system. In this case, bounded by a future light cone, if you care about that. So finally, we can work out the generalized entropy of this empty surface. And its area is 0. It doesn't have any points. So it's just the, jet, the bulk entropy of degrees of freedom in this thing, or equivalently of degrees of freedom sitting in H rad. And it's, it's the bulk entropy where we only treat the quantum fields as classical, and we keep the classical space-time fixed. And I claimed that, uh, that bulk entropy, I'm just going to assume, grows semi-classically, even after the page time. So this is just going to be Hawking's semi-classical thermal entropy. OK? So it's the right answer before the page time, but the wrong af answer after the page time. So my claim is that not only does this give the right answer before the page time, but it's actually the right surface before the page time. So it's actually a derivation of the right answer. I'm going to show this in the following way. Let's just consider a nice Cauchy slice that sort of sticks somewhere close to the horizon. We could choose the maximal volume slice, for example. That would do the job. So schematically, this Cauchy slice looks something like this. We have a boundary up here, and then we go down to the horizon here. And as we go further along the Cauchy slice, we're actually going into the past. And so because the black hole is evaporating, the area actually gets bigger, bulges out down the bottom here. And we have this Hawking radiation. On the maximal volume slice, Hawking radiation is pretty evenly distributed. And it's just entangled between this interior and this other system, H rad. And I've schematically drawn this empty surface as cutting through this bulk and these, these lines that represent bulk entanglement to represent the fact that, yeah, it's generalized entropy is coming from that bulk entanglement. So within this Cauchy slice, I claim that the surface of minimal generalized entropy is indeed the empty surface. So you could, you could decrease the bulk entropy by making the surface non-trivial, right? If I had sort of a blob around here, I could get rid of this bulk entropy. But I would also add some area. And I claim that after the page time, I would always end up adding more generalized entropy from the extra area than I would save by decreasing the bulk entropy. So I think it's a pretty reasonable claim. I'm not going to justify it anymore here. But it's also true that the empty surface is in every single Cauchy slice you can draw because it doesn't contain any points. And so its set of points is contained in anything. OK? So what does that mean? Well, it means that it must be the maximum surface because it's minimal in some slice and it exists in every slice. So the maximum can't be bigger than it. And it's minimal, so it's maximum. So that means that if we believe in quantum maximin, then this must indeed be the quantum RT surface. It means then that the interior is in the entanglement wedge of the CFT here, and not in the entanglement wedge of H rad. And that means that no information has got out. OK, what about after the page time? This is where things are going to get a bit more interesting. I claim now that the following will be true that in any Cauchy slice that you give me, you can make it arbitrarily complicated. I can pick some surface within it, represented by these red dots, that has the following two properties. Firstly, it's going to be entirely outside the event horizon of the black hole. And secondly, it's going to have area that's only slightly bigger than the horizon area at this time. OK? So you might say, you know, if it hits the horizon, I could just choose the point where it hits the horizon. But you might say, oh, what about something that doesn't go to the horizon and it stays just outside the horizon and, and stays as big a big area as possible going back in time, like, say, the past light cone? It's still the case that if I go basically a scrambling time back in time, that the area of a, a surface on this thing will basically be the horizon area plus a Planckian correction. So the leading order, I can make it be the same as the horizon area. OK. Because the surface lies entirely outside the event horizon, the bulk entropy for that surface, given by the bulk entropy of degrees of freedom between it and the boundary, so sort of this region here, is going to be at most order 1. Why is that? Because the only source we have of more than order 1 bulk entropy 
is all these interior modes that are entangled with H rad over this really, really long time. But those are all in the interior of the black hole. So they don't contribute to all of my surfaces outside. But by definition of being after the page time, the horizon error over 4G Newton is less than the semi-classical entropy S rad. It's not meant to have, I just, I just picked it just to satisfy these two properties, because I'm just doing maximum. It doesn't have to be extreme or in any way. OK? My claim, though, is that because this condition is true after the page time, then the generalized entropy of this surface, even though it might not be extreme or in any way, is smaller than the generalized entropy of the empty surface. But we constructed this for every single Cauchy slice. That means if maximin is true, then the empty surface can't be the quantum RT surface because it's not minimal within any Cauchy slice. So there has to exist some other non-empty quantum extremal surface that after the page time is the quantum RT surface. So I'm going to claim that that is indeed true. Specifically, I claim that there exists a non-empty quantum extremal surface that's a sphere sits just inside the event horizon of the black hole, and it's one scrambling time in the past of the current time. What I mean by that is that an ingoing light ray, if it wants to hit this surface, has to start one scrambling time in the past of the boundary time where we're evaluating the entropy and we're evaluating the state. So I claim that this exists both before and after the page time. But before the page time, its generalized entropy is bigger than the generalized entropy of the empty surface. It's only after the page time that there's a first order phase transition in the quantum RT surface, and this one becomes the quantum RT surface. And then after that, black hole continues to evaporate. It just continues to sit one scrambling time behind the sort of current boundary time. But what that means is it ends up going along a space-like trajectory that sort of goes up into this top corner. OK? So that's the story for what the RT surface does. What does that say about the entanglement wedges? Well, let's go through our definition of the entanglement wedge again, right? We first have to start find a space-like surface C that is bounded by the quantum extremal surface and the boundary region. So for boundary region being the CFT, something like this, this surface will do the job. Then the entanglement wedge is the bulk domain of dependence of that surface, which yeah, looks like this. It's bounded by the past light cone again, and it's bounded by light cones going along from the quantum extremal surface. What about for H rad? Now we need to find a Cauchy slice that is bounded by the boundary of this thing here, together with the quantum extremal surface here. OK, what is one? Well, just like a Cauchy slice through this thing, plus a surface that starts at the quantum extremal surface and goes all the way to the origin, to r equals 0. What's the entanglement wedge, then? The domain of dependence of that space-like slice, which just looks like this. It's just bounded by light rays going this direction this time. So somehow, this extra system whose only connection to the black hole is the fact that we threw the Hawking radiation into it, has in its entanglement wedge most of the interior of the black hole. So somehow, entanglement wedge reconstruction is telling us that a version of black hole complementarity is true. That by getting access to the degrees of freedom that encode the Hawking radiation, we've also got access to the degrees of freedom that describe the interior of the black hole. OK, so I made this claim. I'd like to talk a bit about how you actually derive this claim. Um, so if you don't have gray body factors, say you're in 1 plus 1 dimensions, or you just extract the Hawking radiation from pretty close to the horizon before it gets reflected back in, you can just calculate the quantum extremal surface analytically. And this was done in my paper, and it was done for JT Gravity by, by Ahmed and co. Um, and I expect Ahmed's talked about that at some point, so I'm not going to talk about that at all. I'm going to briefly sketch a much more general argument that even when there are gray body factors, there will still be this quantum extremal surface. It will still be one scrambling time in the past. There just might be some unknown sub-leading corrections that are like order beta 
um, so much smaller than the scrambling time. OK. This is the very technical part of the talk. I'm not going to do it slow enough to follow all the details. I'm just trying to communicate the spirit of, of how the arguments work and the sort of tools you need to use. Um, and then I'll get on to more fun stuff. Um, OK, so how does it work? First step is you need to know the metric of the evaporating black hole. It basically just looks like you know, it's, it's a static black hole that's adiabatically changing with time. So we just allow the mass of the black hole to change with time. It looks like this. Um, but this is kind of complicated, and we only really care about the region very, very close to the horizon. So this complicated function, f, the horizon is roughly where f equals 0. We can just approximate by its linear expansion about 0. And we do that. We get this. And we're also only interested in time scales of order the scrambling time. And over that time, the black hole is not evaporating very much. So we can assume that the, sort of the evaporating rate, evaporation rate and the temperature of the black hole are constant in the regions of interest. So that simplifies stuff a lot. Um, but these coordinates, are, these are sort of Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates, and they're still slightly unsatisfying in some way, because outgoing light rays and these coordinates sort of diverge exponentially from one another. Um, and that's slightly complicated to deal with. You can do the calculation of these coordinates. But I'm just going to change r. I'm going to replace r by a outgoing Kruskal-like coordinate, big U. OK? And so I do that. I get this new metric. And the interesting thing about this metric is that now it has an explicit dependence of, on v. OK? It has this exponential factor of e to the 2 pi v over beta out the front. So normally, what you would do is you'd say, oh, that's because I need to replace this infalling time, v, that's like the boundary time that a particle started falling in. I need to replace that by a crystal like coordinate 2, right? That's like basically e to the v. I'm not going to do that because it's convenient to use this little v for my infalling modes, because they're in an inf the infalling vacuum. So I'm just going to leave it in these coordinates, which have this explicit factor at the front. Uh, yes, I am. I, because I'm going to assume the black hole was constructed from spherically symmetric, like infalling matter, and then the symmetry is preserved. And, and you know, you'll 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 have slight asymmetries from the randomness of Hawking radiation, but those should be pretty small and can basically be ignored. Um, right? Which, the Hawking radiation is mostly coming from very low angular momentum modes. Yeah, like this, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, you think that? You th I, I, I don't think I understand. That's <laughs> yeah. Like zero and that's yeah, yeah, sure. I, 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 I'm just confused by the claim. The, the claim, you, you think an evaporating black hole will end up very non-rotationally symmetric? Yeah, there might be some phase where it uh, you know, it acquires a lot of nonlinear structure at very, very small scales, and then doesn't collapse. I mean, we're, we're working in the semi-classical limit where it's very large, everything's very adiabatic, all the changes are very slow. Uh, the, yeah, you, you can even, we can even just assume that we're only extracting the S mode and we're re re letting everything else just reflect back in. And then I, I, I don't think there's any way for, to break. We can do that. I, I, th I think it won't be problematic to include a few other angular momentum modes as well. I think the, the approximation that it's rotationally symmetric will still be a good one. But if, you, if you're not happy with that, then just assume that we're, we're only cons letting the S wave escape. Um, OK. So then we need to think about the bulk entropy. OK? And the important point, as I just said, is that only low angular momentum modes, like order one angular momentum, actually escape the black hole. So they're the only ones that we need to consider. OK? So the problem, the, the, the bulk fields are effectively just a load of two dimensional bulk fields, each describing different angular momentum. We can make it even be just the S wave, as I said. Um, so if we look way back in time here, where they're close to the horizon, the outgoing modes are basically just in the, the, the vacuum with respect to Crisco coordinates, which means that the sort of Rindler modes, the, the ones with respect to like Schwarzschild coordinates or something like that, are in the thermofield double state. Okay, It's all very standard. Then they evolve. We have gray body factors. 
as it starts to escape the sort of sphere of influence of the black hole, some part gets reflected back in, and some part escapes. I cannot get this thing to, OK, I'm just going to click. Um, OK, so the important property that we will use about the thermal field double state is that if I have modes that are separated by a large separation compared to the thermal scale, I uh, look at some mode very, very close here and a mode way out here, we can basically ignore entanglement between them. This is just the fact that thermal states have you know, extensive entropy. There's no correlations at long distances. OK, I'm just going to have to stand over here, I think. Um, OK, so now how do we find the quantum extremal surface? First thing we want to do is we want to extremize over variations where we move it outwards and inwards. I should say, technically, it has to be extremal with respect to infinitely many ways of deforming the state. But because of the rotational symmetry, then all but two of them you get for free. Right? You only have to show that it's extremal with respect to moving along the two light cones while preserving the symmetry. Um, OK, so we need the derivative of the bulk entropy to be equal to the derivative of the area. This you can just calculate. It's that. Um, what about the derivative of the bulk entropy? Well, the first thing you can say is that so long as this is sufficiently far in the past, there's no correlation between the ingoing modes of the horizon and the outgoing modes that are relevant. OK, that's again because of the thermal field double state not having non-local entanglement. Um, so this is just some constant. What about this thing? Well, it has this factor of e to the 2 pi v over beta. OK? And so when we make v sufficiently small, in particular smaller than the scrambling time, this will start to decay away to 0. It will be smaller than order 1. And so this thing will become dominant. OK? So even though it's suppressed by this 1 over 4 g Newton, that gets canceled out by the scrambling time gap, and they can end up competing with each other. So if we didn't have gray body factors, this derivative can just be calculated. And it's just equal to this. Unfortunately, we do. Um, but you can still actually calculate it in the limit where this u is much, much greater than 0. I.e., we've gone really far back in the past, maybe. But we, we're, like the distance from this light ray to the horizon is much smaller than the distance from the horizon to the quantum extremal surface. Again, this is just using the local entanglement structure of the thermal modes, and you get this answer. OK, what about varying the other direction? Well, again, we can calculate the derivative of the area just from the metric, which is this. We can also calculate the derivative of the bulk entropy. So if I move this surface in this direction, the entanglement wedge no longer contains some infalling modes, right? And those infalling modes had some entropy density that is this thing. And so this derivative, naively, is negative. Now, this should feel kind of wrong. Um, and it is wrong. Uh, and the reason it should feel kind of wrong is that black holes are meant to produce entropy, not just absorb entropy. right? Um, so they're, 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 they're producing thermal entropy all the time. That if I move this thing forward in time, I should somehow have a term that gives me that thermal entropy that's being produced. And the answer is that that term should indeed be there. And the reason it should be there is that I ignored until now the cutoffs on both the outgoing modes and the ingoing modes. And implicitly, what I was assuming was that my cutoff on the outgoing modes in units of big U was constant. And that's fine. I can do that. But I also assumed when I said the entropy of the ingoing modes was going down, that the cutoff on my ingoing modes was constant in units of little v. OK? But the trouble with that is that the sort of proper cutoff on like the, the bulk entropy is the product of those two things. Specifically, it's the inner product of those two things uh, with respect to the metric. OK? And the metric had this factor of e to the 2 pi v over beta. And so if I hold my cutoff, constant on the ingoing modes and units of little v and the outgoing modes and units of big U, then when I move it forwards, what I'm really doing is I'm making my proper cutoff like a larger distance scale. Okay? It's growing 
exponentially with time. So what I need to do is I need to sh counter that out by, by shifting the cutoff and making it smaller again so that the proper cutoff is actually constant. And that gives a universal contribution because the, the, the divergence of a 2D mode is universal with respect to epsilon. And it looks like log of epsilon. And it ends up giving a, a term that grows linearly with little b. And that actually gives you exactly this thermal entropy production of the black hole. Um, yeah, I've said it there. OK, so that's the calculation. We now have equations. It's now just a matter of an awful lot of algebra. Uh, and you do stuff, and you can just eliminate little b, and you get this equation here, OK? And the right hand side of this equation is just a constant, and you can show that it's always bigger than 0. What about the left hand side? Well, the left hand side, we don't know what it is, OK? Because it has this, this derivative of the bulk entropy that we can't calculate when we have gray body factors. But fortunately, we can calculate it in two different limits. We can calculate it when u equals 0, because then we have a u here, and so it's just 0. And we can calculate it in the u what limit when u is very large, because I gave you this formula for this thing in the limit when u is very, very large. And it turns out that when you compare things, you'll find that in that limit, the left-hand side is bigger than the right-hand side. So assuming continuity as a function of u, then by the intermediate value theorem, there must be some intermediate positive u0 that is a solution to this equation. OK? Now I can just plug that u0 in and get a solution for little v. And it's a solution that depends on u0, and we have no idea what u0 is. And so it seems like it's horrible. We still don't have a clue what the answer is, um, except for the fact that this u0 is magically inside a log. And logs are amazing, wonderful, awesome things that hide all manner of sins, um, because a log takes this like multiplicative factor that we don't understand at all and turns it into a subleading order beta correction. So in the semi-classical limit, this just looks like log g newton plus some order one thing. And so we get the little v is minus beta over 2 pi log of the entropy of the black hole plus subleading correction, which is indeed exactly the scrambling time. OK. So that was a very technical derivation that I did way too fast for anyone to follow the details of. Um, but hopefully, you got some sense of the spirit of like what you can say and what you can't say. I'm now going to do the fun part of the talk of talking about what the consequences of this quantum RT surface are. Uh, and those are really, really nice. Um, so let's suppose we throw a diary into the black hole. And we throw it in after the page time. That's a diary. That's its world line. It falls in. And what we see is that if we threw this thing in in the recent past, and we look at the state at the boundary here, then the world line of the diary is still sitting in this blue region, OK? Or it passes through the blue region. The, not, the entire thing isn't, but part of it is. And op operators in this blue region can be reconstructed in the CFT. So that means there's an operator in the CFT that tells me what the state of the diary is. In particular, that means there isn't any information about the diary that's escaped in the Hawking radiation. All the information is still there. What about if we let the black hole evaporate some more. World line of the diary is exactly the same, but now this blue region's got smaller, and this green region's got bigger. And so now the world line of the diary passes through the green region instead. So what does that mean? It means that the state of the diary is now encoded as an in an operator in H rad, which is the system that stored the Hawking radiation. Somehow, magically, this Hawking radiation going out has transferred the information over from the CFT to HRAD. OK. So far, so magic. They, like, I, that, I haven't said any mechanism for how that could possibly have happened. I just said that's the conclusion we get from entanglement wedge reconstruction. What about the page curve? Again, magically, the Ryotaki and Nagi formula tells us that the entropy of this boundary region is actually given by the generalized entropy of this surface to leading order just the horizon area. And so we find that, yeah, the, the, the entanglement entropy goes up linearly as s rad and then goes down as a horizon. And that's the page curve. Of course, this should be really very unsatisfying. 
This is, you know, I might as well have just declared by fiat that the page curve is true. You're, what you want is an actual like derivation that makes sense of the bulk dynamics, right? And in particular avoids like the firewall paradox, where these new modes are meant to just be thermally entangled with something that has nothing to do with the early Hawking radiation. So how can they decrease the entropy of it? So there's a very simple heuristic answer to this that has been said by many people before, such as one, um, which is that this Hawking radiation coming out at late times is entangled with the interior, and the interior mode is in the entanglement wedge of H rad, not the entanglement wedge of the CFT. And so, of course, when I take this mode and move it over to H rad, then I'm going to decrease the entanglement entropy, right? Because I've, I've taken a mode that was entangled with H rad and I've moved it to H rad. Now, this story is wrong, and it's wrong in two ways, or at least it's, it's like imprecise in two ways. Um, but magically, those two ways exactly cancel out, and it turns out to be exactly right. Uh, so what are the two ways in which it's wrong? The first is that if this really was just perfectly entangled with H rad, then the change in entropy we get would be the entropy of this mode, where it would be minus the entropy of this mode. But that's actually strictly smaller than the change in the beckenstein hawking entropy, which is the answer we think it should be. Um, and it's not just like a tiny bit smaller, like something that they become the same in the semi-classical limit. It's smaller by a factor of about 1.5, depending on the details of gray body factors. So this is a big problem. It seems like, yeah, and that's just because the generalized second law for an evaporating black hole is a strict inequality. Okay, the entropy of the radiation you end up with is strictly bigger than the entropy of the black hole you started with. So this seems like we've now got a reverse firewall paradox, right? We, 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 the bulk modes seem to be too entangled with the early Hawking radiation to explain the page curve. They're saying it should drop too quickly. Um, but there's another subtlety that we weren't careful about, which is that this RT surface is strictly inside the event horizon. It's not exactly on the event horizon. And these modes are sort of delocalized. They're delocalized over order beta widths, you know, inside and outside the horizon. And so that means we can't really say that this mode, that this outgoing mode is paired up with, is exactly encoded in H rad. It's sort of spread out a bit. And magically, the two corrections from these two things will always necessarily cancel each other out perfectly. Um, so let's see why. So they seem naively totally, totally different. One is a change in classical area that in this weird gravitational amorphous way corresponds to entropy. Okay? The other is just looking at this bulk mode, looking at what it's entangled with, and seeing the like, small change in bulk entropy that results from moving it over from one system to the other. So how could they possibly have anything to do with each other? So yeah, so, so the first one is the change in area from between this RT surface and the RT surface slightly later time. The second one is the change in bulk entropy when I extract the modes in this little small time window here. So it's the entropy of this slice rather than this slice. But the answer is that secretly, both of these things are not a change in either bulk entropy or area. They're both a change in generalized entropy. So this change in the area of the RT surface we're really interested in changing the generalized entropy of the RT surface just because of the approximate time symmetry Then the bulk entropy stays the same when we move forward in boundary time and move the RT surface forward in boundary time. What about this just change in the bulk entropy? Well, in that case, it's also a change in bulk in generalized entropy, just one where we update the boundary time, but we don't update the RT surface. We just leave that fixed. And so that means that the area term just doesn't change, and so the change in generalized entropy is just equal to the change in bulk entropy. So both these calculations are a change in generalized entropy, just with different RT surfaces, or different rules for how we update the RT surface. But the RT surface is a quantum extremal surface, so it doesn't matter whether we do this infinitesimal updating of our RT surface or not, we'll get exactly the same answer either way around because the, the, the gradient of the generalized entropy with respect to the RT surface is zero. So even though the, the bulk entropy gradient and the area gradient are separately big, 
they have to be exactly the same because the gradient of their sum has to be equal to zero. So entanglement wedge reconstruction means you can never have a firewall paradox. You can never, at least the, the AMPS version, you can never have a problem where the entanglement of the bulk modes seems inconsistent with the change in entropy given by the Ryutaki Nagi formula. OK. So we've got a long way, OK? We've derived Hayden Preskill using sort of RT magic. We derived the page curve using RT magic. And we've even explained how the sort of magic of the page curve going, entropy going downwards is consistent with the bulk modes and how they're entangled with one another. But we've still got a problem. And it's the, a big problem because it's really the problem of the information paradox, which is how on earth does this bulk mode going out actually know anything at all about something that fell in? Right? This mode is it just entangled with this mode, OK? And it's the, the entanglement between the two is just the vacuum state. And it doesn't care at all about the state of something we threw in way down here. And so even if this bulk mode is actually a mode in the early Hawking radiation rather than a mode in the like CFT, then we can explain the entropy going down, but we can't explain how different like black hole initial states end up giving us different final states. It seems like everything should just end up in the same pure final state. And the reason we can't explain that is whether we're missing the final piece of the puzzle, which is state dependence. Okay? It's a pretty weak form of state dependence. It's state dependence when you're trying to reconstruct something on a subsystem rather than the entire system. So there was a paper that I put out with my advisor, Patrick Hayden, uh, last summer um, that says the following. It says that if you do prove entanglement wedge reconstruction carefully, what you find is that if you want to do the reconstruction and have it work for all the states in a given code space, and you don't want your reconstruction to depend on the state, you just want one to work for every state in a code space, you need your bulk operator to be in the entanglement wedge. You need it to be in the entanglement wedge for all states in the code space. Both unsurprising, but slightly more non-trivially, you need it to be in the entanglement wedge even for mixed states in the code space, as well as pure states. And we'll see that this gives an important distinction. And if it's only in the entanglement wedge for pure states, you can do a reconstruction, but it's a reconstruction that will have to be state dependent. Like you'll have to tell me the state before I can tell you the operator that you should use. So yeah, this was all proved by, or proved, um, <laughs> argued by as, 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 as rigorously as you can do any of this stuff by, by me and Patrick last summer. Um, so let's, let's see what the consequences are. Let's say. Rather than just considering one black hole microstate, I consider a code space of a large number of black hole microstates, like much less than the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, but maybe exponential in 1 over G Newton. Okay, maybe I had a small black hole there initially, and I didn't know the state of the small black hole. And then there was a load of energy that th got thrown into the black hole. So we do now know something about it, because we know it had to have come from a small black hole plus a load of energy thrown in. But there's a lot we don't know still. Okay, So I can represent that degrees of freedom, this green blob down the bottom. And the point is that for very mixed states in the code space, then that green blob can have a very large amount of bulk entropy. right? And in particular, yeah, and that bulk entropy contributes to the generalized entropy of this surface for H rad. But it doesn't contribute to the generalized entropy of the empty surface because they're not in the entanglement wedge if the empty surface is the RT surface. So if this gets too big, then the, generous, the, the RT surface can get pushed to the empty surface, even after the page time. Because for the very mixed states, we wouldn't have reached the page time yet, because they're so mixed. Okay. And in fact, the condition for this happening is when the entropy of your code space is just bigger than the difference between the bekenstein hawking entropy up here and the thermal entropy of the radiation. And this is actually exactly consistent with what you expect from toy models. Um, so that's nice. It's uh, uh, nice to, to get things consistent with what we expect. But far more importantly, it also explains how the information actually gets out. OK, let's tell the story I just told one more time. So this outgoing mode 
is entangled with an interior mode. The entanglement between the two, the state of the two, is just the vacuum state, doesn't care about what you threw in. OK? But now, the encoding of this interior operator in the Hawking radiation will depend on the state of the black hole. Like, I might be able to find one encoding that works for a load of microstates, but if I have too many, then I can't do it. OK? So what does this mean? It means that if I'm an observer only having access to the Hawking radiation, OK, and then I see this stuff come out, then by seeing the mode that it was entangled with, I can learn about the state of what it fell in, because I'm learning about how this interior operator is encoded in HRAD. By looking at what the state of this thing and the mode in HRAD it's entangled with, I can like you know, reverse engineer what this was and therefore learn about what the, uh, the, what about the information that was thrown into the black hole. So this is exactly what happens in uh, random unitaries. It's exactly what we should expect to happen. I think it's the right answer for the mechanism of how, how the information actually gets out. Um, OK, so I'm just going to go through some conclusions, and I'm going to talk very briefly about a small chunk of, of follow-up work that's happening at the moment. So I showed that there's a phase transition in the quantum RT surface of an evaporating black hole that happens at exactly the page time. And that after the page time, the new RT surface is just inside the horizon, one scrambling time in the past. This explains the page curve just because of the RT formula. And it also explains Hayden Preskill using entanglement wedge reconstruction. But more than that, it provides the mechanism that makes the page curve consistent with the bulk entanglement structure because of entanglement wedge reconstruction. And so we don't have a firewall paradox. The bulk modes are consistent with the entropy going down. And finally, the state dependence of the entanglement wedge reconstruction provides the mechanism which, by which the, the outgoing Hawking modes are able to carry out information about the black hole. So I'm not going to talk about this, but it turns out there would still be some Paradoxes you could find if entanglement wedge reconstruction had to be totally exact. Um, but these are exactly avoided by the, the non-perturbatively small corrections that we expect to have in entanglement wedge reconstruction just from the sum over different saddles. And so, yeah, again, everything ends up being consistent. OK, let me talk about some follow-up work uh, with Douglas Stanford. Uh, Steve Schenker and Jenbin Yang. Um, and this work has a lot of aspects to it. I'm just going to talk about one very small aspect, which is let's try and just make the simplest possible situation we can find where we have this sort of physics going on. OK? So our model that we like to use and makes things very, very clear is we just have JT gravity, OK? And we, but we add in end of the world brains. And we allow those end of the world brains to carry an index. And we're going to end up making the number of indexes, the, the, the sort of the range of values that index can take, very, very, very large. Um, and you, know, the, it, you might say, oh, is that physical or not? But fundamentally, it's, it's, it's a bulk model we can define. And it, it gives answers, consistent answers. And so yeah, I didn't think there's anything really wrong, wrong with it. So we're going to consider states where you make an end of the world brain, you evolve for a bit of Euclidean time, but the state of that end of the world brain, you make maximally entangled with just an arbitrary auxiliary reference system. So this reference system is going to represent the Hawking radiation. And the end of the world brain it's entangled with represents the interior modes. OK? And note that. You know, we didn't make this a holographic system or anything like that. It's just an arbitrary uh, quantum mechanical system. And we want to calculate the entropy of the re reference system, both before the page time, when the number of sort of labels for the index here is small compared to e to the Beckenstein Hawking entropy. We also want to calculate it when we make the number of indices here like even, even larger than the Beckenstein Hawking entropy. We make it really, really huge. That's the sort of after the page time case. 
Okay, and in some ways that's the more interesting one. So naively, it seems like the answer in both cases is just that the, the, the state on this thing is maximally mixed, right? Um, like we have we have this JT gravity brain with an index that has no dynamics, and so seemingly like different states are exactly orthogonal. Um, and yeah, so we, we, we have a maximally mixed reference state, and so the entropy should be log of the dimension of the reference system. But yeah, that should have appeared at the start of this slide. Uh, but really, we know the right thing to do is to calculate the entropy using the replica trick. OK? So let's do that. The, the, the sort of boundary that we have is we have, we have n independent JT gravity boundaries if we're trying to calculate the Rayney n entropy. And the, the, the way the reference systems get linked up, because they get swapped between the different boundaries, is that they just go around in a cycle like this. OK? And as long as the dimension of the reference system isn't too big, then the dominant geometry is just n independent copies of a disk. And then we normalize it by n independent copies of the disk, but this time the reference system is not getting swapped between the geometries. Okay, we're just dividing through by the trace of rho to the n. This is trace of rho to the n with the n inside. Um, and yeah, so, so what's the answer you get? Well, the gravity contribution is the same on both the top and bottom, because we just have n disks on the top and n disks on the bottom. But on the top, we only have one loop of this reference system. Okay? And so we only get one factor of dr from summing over all the possible values it can take. Whereas on the bottom, we have n of them. And so what we end up with is an answer for e to the, yeah, it, 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 answer of 1 over dr to the n minus 1. Find the Rayney entropy, take the log of this, divide it by n minus 1, get log dr. Analytically continue to n equals 1 to get von Neumann entropy, get log dr. Okay? So this is the first half of the page curve. What about when we make this system really, really, really large? Okay? The answer now is that the fact we only have one loop here versus n down the bottom here gives us huge, huge suppression. It gives us suppress suppression of this factor, and we've made this thing really, really huge. We've made it bigger than e to the f. So what ends up happening is that a different type of saddle dominates. And the type of saddle is just one disk that's sort of glued together by the, the, the end of the world brains going from one boundary around to the next boundary. And so now we have n independent little loops on both the top and bottom. So it's no longer suppressed by any factors of 1 over dr. Okay? But what we do have is that the genus of this thing is only 1, whereas the genus of this thing is n. Okay? And JT gravity has a, a, a term that looks like e to the s naught times the, sorry, when I said genus, I meant uh, Euler character. Um, and so this thing ends up getting suppressed by a factor of e to the minus n minus 1. S0. Again, take the log, divide by n minus 1, analytic continue, and we get the answer for von, von Neumann entropy of basically S0. So this, this replica trick calculation, this second set of saddles, is basically corresponding to the fact that we have a non-empty RT surface. In this case, it's actually just a classical extremal surface. And when the generalized entropy of that is smaller than the generalized entropy of the empty surface, then the, the, the replica trick wants to replicate around our RT surface rather than trying to replicate around the, uh, the empty surface. So rather than n independent space times, we get one space time replicating about this extremal surface. So what does this mean? It means that when we calculate non-holographic entropies, and in fact, even when we calculate bulk entropies, using the bulk replica trick, because really that corresponds to exactly the same thing of just you know, pull it out and switch it over, um, we can get a different answer than we get by treating the, semi the, the classical background as fixed and looking at the entropy of the quantum fields on that background. And, and the semi-classical entropy that you, you would think is, is what you would get 
For the replica entropy, when you have the trivial saddle where you just have n disconnected space times and you don't have back reaction, they don't get joined together. Um, so this is sort of, you know, I mean, it's, it's easy to see this much more generally, but this is like why the, the quantum extremal islands prescription, as it's called in, in paper by, by Ying and Ahmed and Raghu and Wan, uh, is like the right, the right way to determine the entropy, even of a non-holographic system, uh, or even of, of bulk modes. You still need to consider quantum extremal surfaces. It's also why you, you might feel unhappy that when I calculated the generalized entropy of the empty surface in an evaporating black hole, I just used this like naive semi-classical answer, which we know to be wrong. Right? The answer is that it's the right answer if you calculated the generalized entropy using the replica trick using the trivial saddle where the space times don't get connected. But that's not the entropy that dominates when you calculate it using the replica trick. The, the, the saddle that dominates is one that connects all the different space times together. Um, it also makes very clear something that's more generally true, which is that the same saddles that we needed to get the right answer for the rep entropy also lead to some very weird and slightly disturbing non-factorization problems. In particular, if i is not equal to j, then in this trivial theory, then the sort of inner product of the state where I put in index i and state where I put in index j is equal to 0. But if we look at the modular squared, then I can have a geometry like this, where I have a cylinder. And so the i index does actually get met up with the i index, and the j index gets met up with the j index, and it doesn't matter that they're different. This thing is suppressed by an e to the minus s naught, but it's still there. Okay? And so what it tells us you know, in this trivial theory, where that's all we have and nothing more, is that it's not looking like an ordinary unitary theory on the boundary. It's looking like a disorder averaged unitary theory, where basically these states, psi i instead of j, are just like random states in a sort of hard random or or ensemble. And when we calculate this using the gravitational path integral, we're calculating the expectation value of that thing of the ensemble. And then this is just different to this. And you can actually find the distribution for like you know, higher moments of this, and, and everything works out consistent with a random average. Um, but n equals 4 super Yang mills is not a disorder average theory, we think. Um, so yeah, Ahmed? Um, is, uh, if, if I just do psi i psi j uh -huh. in this theory, in this bulk calculation, in this bulk theory, it is exactly equal to 0. But if I look at the modular squared in this bulk theory, then it is not exactly equal to zero because the i can get paired up with another i and the j can get paired up with another j. So yeah, it, it, this, this is consistent if by what we mean by this is is the average in an ensemble, um, but it's not consistent otherwise. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. In the, in the but well, this this is a theory, right? JT gravity with end of the world brains is a theory. I can I can define it. Like, if, if, if you want your theory to be like one element of the ensemble, then, then, then you know, you, you can have that be a theory and it, it will give answers where this is instead some like Gaussian distributed thing. Yeah? So, isn't the problem that JT gravity is actually not a theory in this kind of UIP formula or in general the deconstruction of the theory? JT gravity with multiple topologies is a theory where that's true. It's it's just a it, it's a theory with disorder averages. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, sure. It's 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 not a. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, like like what I would yeah. It, it's Euclidean path integrals in JT gravity are calculating a disorder average over an ensemble of theories, um, and and what this you know, what these calculations are telling us are the the average of the behavior of things like the entropy and that, that ensemble of theories. Um, but there's the question of if we just have one theory on the ensemble, how can we you know, understand the same effect without mentioning any other theories in the ensemble? And one would hope that there's, you know, Steve likes to talk about uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, these connected topologies being like a diagonal sum over like a, a load of possible like boundary conditions and, and that really what you have is you just have 
You have the off diagonal terms too, but they can be ignored in these sort of calculations. It's self-averaging. Um, but fundamentally, you can just consider one copy and you can calculate the same answer. You can calculate the full Gaussian thing. That would, that would be the dream. I don't think we know anyone knows how to do that, probably. Certainly not in, in super young wheels. Um, so yeah, thanks.